And so today we're doing part three, which is primarily, I mean, I call it cholesterol, but in reality it's also the steroids. Uh, it's like the cholesterol-based lipids. Okay. The good, the bad, and the running. Oh, it's because I forgot to show you guys the video. I didn't never guys. I never showed you guys the video last semester, did I? Of cholesterol. If we have time today, at the end, I'll show you the video. Okay, if I can find it on YouTube, it's been a while. I forgot to look it up. That's where the name come from, by the way. Okay. Oh, come on now. So, acetyl CoA is the initial. Uh, Precursor, that's what I was looking for, for cholesterol and all the steroids. Okay, which is still okay, has how many carbons in it? Two carbons. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry. Alright, so, <laughs> and so that's also written up there, so please don't overthink it. I just want you to know the steps from acetylcholine to mevalonate. I know at this point in time you wouldn't know what mevalonate is, but trust me, the reason why is because it becomes very, very, it's like 30 some odd steps to get to cholesterol. You do not need to know all the steps, okay? Now, if I picked an individual step out of it, and actually, like, what class or classes of enzymes do you think you do? I would expect you to be able to make a, a logical guess or answer, right? You know, bedding, phosphate using ATP or DTP, it would most likely be a kinase, that kind of thing, right? But I definitely want you to know from the silicone and the Mevalonate. Because it's, it's, there's, there are major, major medical implications with respect to it. Okay, and so, you might as well just go ahead and get started. This is already available on my fire, by the way. I put it on there. <clears throat> so, in the beginning, we have two acetyl-CoA's. When one acetyl-CoA loves another acetyl-CoA, they know. Okay, so, <laughs> I mean, all right, we've actually seen this enzyme before. What enzyme can take two acetyl CoA's, put them together to make acetyl, acetyl, acetyl CoA? So it's to me, it's just a stupid name. Two plus two. Pardon? Maybe, is it? I don't know. We've actually seen this one, this enzyme before. Maybe we saw it in the reverse. What took. A four carbon containing compound and broke it down to two acetyl coates. Notice it's reversible. It's thiolase. Our good friend thiolase. <coughs> it's the return of thiolase. All right. <coughs> Here we go. So, so then we have another class of enzymes. It's going to take that acetyl, acetyl, acetyl CoA kick off the coenzyme A by adding another acetyl group to it. And notice, and I mean, I know the name is a mouthful. Beta hydroxy, beta methyl glutarol CoA. Everybody just calls it HMG CoA. You, you may have actually heard of HMG or HMG CoA because like I said, it's a major um, biomolecule. Of course, the glutarol part looks just like glutamate and that's where it gets its name. And the beta hydroxy, beta methyl, you can see it on there. But okay, <clears throat> see, beta hydroxy, beta methyl. <coughs> Sorry about that. So, what class or classes of enzymes can actually do this? Possibly. Possibly. So, could it be a transferase or could it be a synthase? Let's start thinking about the um, which one would make the mo more logical sense. A transferase or a synthase, we're taking the acetyl group, and we are transferring it and adding it on to make something bigger. So does it make sense, more sense for it to be a transferring or to make this something, you know, like synthase? So I can see where you can make the argument for either one, but which one do you suppose this one is? Synthase. This is a synthase, okay? Because the acetyl CoA by itself is pretty much considered like a building block. It's like taking one Lego and adding it to something else, so you can think about it. No, this is a synthase. And so if you're going to call it something, what would you call it? HMG CoA. It's HMG CoA synthase. <laughs> That's pretty simple. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> and then finally, the last step to go from HMG CoA to mevalonate 
Notice we utilize two NADPHs. We get off two NADPs and we get off the coenzyme A, which the coenzyme A will go on to be used for the umpteen million different things that we use coenzyme A for. And that's how we get methylonic. So what class or classes of enzymes could this be? I could see a couple of different names. What's one of them? <clears throat> a dehydrogenase. If you had at this point in time said, okay, it's such and such dehydrogenase, I would give you the credit for it. This one does technically have a nether, what's another name for dehydrogenase? Reductase. And this is, it's a common name and it's, it's stuck with this common name. So this one is a reductase, but yeah, if you had said a dehydrogenase, I would give you the credit for it because it truly is a dehydrogenase. Okay. So if you're going to name this one, you put the reductase with it, what would you call it? Pardon? Say it with some conviction. HMG. Technically, this is H. coa reductase, which is very, very important. Why is this one so important? I mean, we will go talk about it more later, but what else? Why do you suppose this stuff is so important? If you just had a guess. Pardon? Well, it does require an ADPH. Mm -hmm. What else is it? This is the major checkpoint, okay? And so there are lots of drugs that focus in right there. Because if you block it here, you block the uh, cholesterol biosynthesis, the endogenous cholesterol biosynthesis. It's kind of redundant. Endogenous. You block it. Okay, so endogenous and biosynthesis. <laughs> Your body's ability to make its own cholesterol. Okay. Give everybody a moment to get caught up. So just three steps, one of them we've seen before. Because one of them, that very first one, is just three, the last step of beta oxidation. The cloudlase, the HMG-CoA synthase, and then the HMG-CoA reductase. And you may have already heard of, or maybe you know some people who are on HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. Okay. Like I said, it's, it's pretty common. That's just to get to mevalonate. Then to go from mevalonate to squalene, which squalene is also considered a precursor for, um, for cholesterol. And I don't know why this fact, this little factoid stuck in my head or not, or why, but it's named after sharks. Squalene. It just did. Okay, but it takes many steps. That's why I say, for example, if I just picked out one of these and covered it up with a box and said, okay, 5-phosphomevalonate becoming 5-pyrophosphomevalonate using ATP, what would you call it? Well, or what class of classes of enzymes? It's a reduct. I mean, it's a kinase. Oh, that would have thrown you for a loop. Okay, so, you know, and this one is a transferase and so on and so forth. Decarboxylase. But I'm not going to have you. There's lots of stuff. That's just to get quality. Okay, so please don't write this down. Just, just to recognize. I mean, I'd, rec I, I'd expect you to recognize the term squalene, okay, or squalene, depending upon your accent. Yeah, it shows from the 5 pyrophosphate blah, 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 to the 3 phosphate 5 pyro. It's a decarboxylase, but it's using ATP. So, like, if you were to give us that one, how would how we do this? If you had told me, like, carboxykinase or something like that, I probably would have given you credit. For it, or if you had told me it was a kinase, like is there a phosphate? Yeah, yeah. Then I would have given you credit for that one. Okay. Because mm -hmm. that's why a lot of times I usually ask you for your logic. Okay. Have you explain. Yeah. Why yeah. does it have the carboxyl group highlighted when it was there to begin with? Yeah. That's the CO two group that's leaving in the next step. Oh, okay. So see. So you got the Oh, the two. Oh, so there's an intermediate. Yeah, it's intermediate. Oh, so that, that's why it has the... Color. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. The phosphorylation of it is just, because it's the same enzyme, it's just showing, and that's why it's in the little brackets, it just shows you that phosphorylates it to make it a better leaving group at the end, so... Yeah. So it's more... Because you could see... I mean, I'm going to hypothesize. I don't know. I've never worked on the mechanism on this one before. But you, we've seen decarboxylations before to where that bond comes down and something's got to break or give. This bond's what's going to break and it's going to come to form a double bond here. But then something else has to break or give and it's going to be the phosphate will leave. So that's why you phosphorylate it first because it's a better leaving group. 
if it wasn't there, that phosphorylate, there's nothing there that could be a leaving group. Okay, and that's the reason why. Like, if you're doing this in organic chemistry, you, you know, you, you put a better leaving group on there to make, a, make an alkene. And, and so, like, that's like two Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that first half would be the activation, the coupling. That's why a lot of times we say that you know you, you have ATP, we use it for energy. This is how we're using it for energy. You phosphorylate first; it's higher in, in energy, so it makes this off phosphorylation, the, uh, not phosphorylation, the removal of inorganic phosphate gives off a lot of energy. That's how you couple it together. Okay. All right. So yeah, no, that one, this step, I would have to show you the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, if I only showed you this part right here, I would expect you to tell me it was a kinase. Okay. <laughs> um, then it takes at least 25 more steps to go from squalene to cholesterol. You do not need I didn't even have to know that. Not the bike, Mr. Reader. Yes. Um, back up in that very large picture. This one? Whoops, the writing. Yeah, so there are lots of steps. You don't need to know them. Lots of research is done on it because, you know, cholesterol is bad. Well, that's what they say. But the cholesterol has, has, has its good uses, too, is that our diet is so full. All right, then cholesterol itself is a starting material for a whole host of different or, uh, compounds, including the bile salt. Well, it is a bile salt if it's an acid. But bile acids. <laughs> <laughs> the sex hormones, the mineral corticoid hormones, and the glucocorticoid hormones. Okay. Like that's just from general anatomy and physiology. That thing, earth shattering here. So all of this originally came from lowly acetyl-CoA. Which in theory, you could have gotten acetyl-CoA in lots of different ways. You know, so that's why we could even back this all the way up. So now you can imagine and start to link things together. If you take in a lot of sugar, it's going to have an effect on this pathway as well, right? Because that sugar goes all the way down to pyruvate. Pyruvate will become acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA will get shelled through energy. You don't need it anymore, so it's going to build up fats, and it's going to build up your cholesterol stuff. Stuff that's not the right scientific term. But you kind of get the idea now. So that's why they're all interlinked. Don't be surprised. I have asked that question before on Biochemistry 2 final. Okay, something similar to that. And so just to see if you guys can start to put the different metabolic pathways together to see how the interplay occurs. Because they're they are not um, isolated events. It's not like you just have glycolysis and then you have lipid biosynthesis. They are going to be linked together via pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Does that make sense? That's also how you can get some really weird side effects. You know, you take certain drugs and say, may cause your lipid levels to go up or may cause stomach discomfort or what have you. <clears throat> okay, so this is an example here, your steroid hormones. Do not memorize these. I would just, just like last semester, I would expect you to recognize the cholesterol-based hormones based off of their tetracyclic conformation. Remember, you always have three, six contain, um, Carbon rings, it goes cyclohexyl, 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 and then cyclopentyl ring. Okay. <clears throat> so I would expect you to know that and recognize it, but I wouldn't ask you, is this you know cortisone versus progesterone? I'd have to look it up, so I would ask you to do it. So okay. <clears throat> Any questions here on just like knowing what the recognition of these are in that sense? Or if I asked you, I would expect you to know testosterone is a sex hormone at this point in time. Or, you know, what an estrogen versus an androgen is. I think that's pretty, pretty safe. At the very end of your academic career at Southeastern. Okay. I do want to give you a moment to look at this. And think, this has one of the strangest names. Common names it's known by. But I want you to come up with this, the name for this enzyme. So this is how we store cholesterol. You don't store, it's a misnomer when we say, oh, they have high cholesterol. You know, it's, that did not get picked up, I'm sure, in the money. High cholesterol, that kind of thing. Uh, because of the fact that typically you don't store cholesterol as cholesterol, you're going to store it as cholesterol esters. Now, I would expect you to know the reason why. We talked a little bit about that last semester. We're going to discuss it in just a moment in detail. Oh, and CE, 
stage for cholesterol esters, because that's how they abbreviate it. A lot of times, even on blood screening, if you ever saw that, you went into lipid levels, like your lipid panels, it may come up as like um, HDL and LDL and VLDL or CE and stuff like that. Um, TG would be triglyceride. <coughs> This is a relatively simple process. We have cholesterol. We've got an acyl CoA. No, this is not acetyl necessarily. So that means acyl means it could be 20 long. You know, it could be really long, or it could just be acetyl. But you got a big old fatty acyl CoA, and you're sticking it on the alcohol portion of cholesterol. Okay, so what class or classes of enzymes could this be? Who wants to take it? Don't overthink it. It's a what? It is an acyl transferase. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, what specific acyl transferase is it? It's kind of a misnomer. Acyl transferase by itself is a generic, but what's it transferring it to? It's cholesterol acyl transferase. Okay, where did it get it from? Cholesterol. So this is like almost like hangman. Hey like there's four parts. You've got you're missing the first one. There's blank cholesterol acyl transferase. Acyl CoA. Acyl CoA. So put it all together. It's acyl CoA, cholesterol acyl transferase, and it's more commonly called. I break out in hives thinking about a cat. I'm allergic to cats, that's why. It's not that scary cats. But yes, it's A-cat because it's got an name that's so long, but that's why I want you to know where the name came from. It's acyl-CoA, cholesterol acyl transferase. It tells you exactly what it does. So there's no doubt. It literally transfers an acyl group between acyl-CoA and cholesterol. <coughs> but it's really long, and so they just call it A-cat. But if I told you, oh, there's a cat here, I don't know, it would have got lost. All right, so why? What's the whole purpose? Why make these cholesterol esters if you're wanting to store them? What? They're not as reactive. They're not, they're not as reactive. That's true. What else? It could be for transporting and for storage. Why? Think back to organic chemistry. What's the big difference between cholesterol and a cholesterol ester besides reactivity? That's kind of like the Miss America kind of answer. It's fantastic. Well, which one is it? Is it hydrophilic or hydrophobic? So, is cholesterol more or less hydrophilic? Well, let's see. Or, I don't know, I'm going to start with this one. <laughs> you were right on one of those, but you said both. So, is cholesterol the hydrophilic one, relatively speaking, or is the hydrophobic one, relatively speaking? What? So, let's vote. How many people see cholesterol is hydrophobic, cholesterol is hydrophilic? I know, some of you said it. Please don't tell the truth in the best way with your spiritual life. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> God saves. <laughs> then we're going to make the other argument. Think back to organic chemistry. Let's say that you've got an arachidon. Well, it's not arachidonic because it's got double bonds in it. Well, or it could be. This is an example. You put something like a big old palmitate, that's the one they told you, never mind, that's 16 carbons, it's all saturated. So this is a palmitoyl CoA. You're sticking a palmitate or a palmitoyl group here on the cholesterol ester. Is it gonna be more or less hydrophobic? More hydrophobic. <clears throat> okay. Cholesterol esters are gonna be more hydrophobic than the alcohol. <coughs> cholesterol itself is not hydrophilic though. Okay, it's still hydrophobic. This makes it even more hydrophobic. Why is that better for storage and for transport for that matter? It stays in the like, membrane. It's going to, well, that or it's going to stay in the little droplets and keep it. Because you don't want the cholesterol to If you left it this way, it could form, be more likely to form plaques and things like that. Like reasons, because it can do hydrogen bonding and stuff. If you form this, they are going to stay in their little bubbles, so to speak. My word, not scientific term for it. And to be transported. Okay. Or for long term storage, it's going to exclude water. Okay, so it's more hydrophobic. 
All right, so we actually, I think this is a repeat, you know, coming from this chapter, you've seen this kind of thing last semester as well. These, I do want you to know the big difference between, these are the, oh, don't do that to me. These are the two, there's like a delay. These are the two here that most often get um, discussed with respect to the lipid panels. But there's that whole, just like this one doesn't have I LDL, it's just an intermediate, which stands between LDL and HDL, you know. And I've seen some people talk about VHDL, but, you know, it's an issue there. Especially if you compare and contrast LDL and, and HDL, don't memorize the numbers, but why does it make sense that HDL is going to have more protein than LDL. It's high density, because what, which has a higher density, but I'm, which biomolecule has a higher density, protein or like lipids? Proteins, lipids, they, they're fat, so fat flows on top of water. Lipids, not a lot of proteins, sometimes they don't necessarily. Um, in fact, if they're, if they're greater than one, then they won't. <clears throat> okay, so that's why the higher the protein content, the higher the density. So those that tend to be lower in density will have a much higher lipid content. That being said, which of those two, just comparing LDL and HDL, that's when you hear about people talk about, and it drives me nuts, even though I do too. It drives me, I, I, I always have to bite my tongue when my doctor talks to me about my good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. These are not cholesterol, people. They're cholesterol esters. They're lipoproteins. But, and it drives me nuts, I'm gonna say, you should know this, you had to take biochemistry, I know you did. So, <laughs> but I don't. But she's really nice, this doctor. I have been snipping to a few times with doctors. <laughs> God, I love snipping. Okay, I told the one, she better not call me her boy anymore. I said, even my mom doesn't call me her boy. So, you know, you didn't birth me, so. <laughs> she said, oh, we're gonna use the big boy cuff. Don't do that. So, okay, all right, so which one of these, LDL or HDL, is the good, quote unquote, good cholesterol? Because whenever they talk about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, these are the two they're comparing. Which one is good? HDL. HDL, okay? The way that I think about it is happy DL. Happy is good. And I can think of something else. Lame. Lame. So, whatever, what's your boat? LDL is the bad cholesterol. And once again, another thing medically to keep in mind is that um, it's not just the sheer values when you do your lipid panels. Another thing they do is they look at the ratio of either LDL to HDL. Because, so for, I, I very rarely defend myself, my lipid panel, my LDL is good, it's in, it's in the favorable range, but my HDL is too low. Okay, and it's a genetic thing. My grandfather had the same issue. My dad had the same issue. Uh, one of these professors said, doesn't have the same issue since you're the men in my family do. But, and so then the ratio gets off. Okay. And so then we have to have, to have special bias and things like that. So, um, but that's why, it's not that my bad cholesterol is bad. <laughs> is, is, no, wrong. I can't think. You know, hopefully you understand. I've had two hours of sleep, so I'm not making much sense. <sighs> All right, but my ratio gets off, and so that's one thing to keep in mind. That's what this next thing is saying. <clears throat> All right, so this HDL is the good. It just it does drive me nuts. You know, we still talk about this. This is the common vernacular. Like if you're talking to your granny and you say, "Well, how's your good cholesterol, grandma?" Then you're talking about the HDL. Okay. Now, if you are talking to a biochemist or maybe a doctor that's an endocrinologist or something, they may. You know, saying technically, <laughs> it's cholesterol esters that's on the inside, and then the lipids. It's not just cholesterol. You can see here, it's not just cholesterol esters. The quote unquote good is over half protein. So, therefore, um, but, yeah, so you can see it. Right. <clears throat> kind of microns, by the way, are those that are the lowest in density. Right. And those are nasty looking things. Kind of microns, like how many people just ate? How many people just had Papa John's? Did anyone have Papa John's? Where did you eat? I probably was affected too. And so, but, or french fries or anything that's kind of starchy. Um, this is what it should look like. See, it's nasty. All right, so you look at this, and it looks even worse if you look at it on the computer whenever you look at this, that right after you eat, especially something that's starchy or higher in lipids, then don't, like, if they try to take your blood after that, there's a 
definite pull. That's not the serial killer or something in Dexter. Uh, but it's a little bit more difficult. So it's more fat latent than it would be like with the extra fast. Okay, because the chylomicrons actually are still in the body. After right through the, they are they're nasty. Okay. Any questions so far? Because now we're going to kind of start to put some things together with the cartoon. I like that. I completely plagiarized from the other, the old book. <clears throat> I like it better than the one in your book. Okay. Understand this and the logic behind it. <clears throat> I showed you something similar in this last semester when we did uh, lipids as well. This is one of the few things that the nursing biochemistry had the textbook I thought did, did well. Okay. First of all, the little picture on the left is one that we've seen something like that before. It's just to show you kind of what these um, uh, lipoprotein complexes look like. That's why on the inside there's cholesterolesterides, there's triglycerides, there's lots of different things. It's not just cholesterol per se, because technically cholesterol is usually going to be in, a li in the lipid itself. Okay, but understand this right here. So this is just to show you LDL, once again, is that the good, quote unquote good or the bad cholesterol? LDL? It's bad, it's lame. Okay, so the LDL comes, it has apolipoprotein, or I'm sorry, apoprotein B100 on it, and it's going to bind to its receptor. There's that clathrin coated pit. That, that gets recruited once there's the conformational change and it does encapsulate or no imaginate that's a better word for it imaginate the membrane right there in order to pinch it off okay and that's when it's going to internalize it within the cell the ph gradient does change as it goes throughout the cell okay and at some point in time and i don't know i don't have it memorized whenever the at what ph changes from one thing to another it's going to be um it's going to in indicate that it no longer uh, that needs to regenerate, I should say, the, the, the receptor. And so it'll send the receptors back to the plasma membrane. And then what's going to happen is the lysosome is going to chew up all the pieces. The protein portions of it can be used for protein synthesis or the host, whole host of different things that we've seen that amino acids be used for. It's the lipids that we're going to be focusing on right now. Okay, And the lipids are going to be broken down. You have your cholesterol and cholesterol esters. <clears throat> All right, so that's one way to get cholesterol. The second way to get cholesterol, and that's, so that's the exogenous, the, that from your diet. From your, from your body, we've already talked about right now the synthesis of cholesterol. It goes through hmg coa reductase, which is kind of like the gatekeeper of the whole system. It has, you know, another 30 steps or so that goes all the way down to make cholesterol. The cholesterol is going to increase in concentration, either exogenously or endogenously. And then ACAT comes in and it transfers the acyl group on it. That way we can store it. All right. So now, how does this thing get activated or inhibited? <clears throat> so what happens is if the, or when the cholesterol gets really, really high, one thing is you can go ahead and use it for the very various things that cholesterol is used for. Okay. But the big thing is if there's way too much based off of your diet or endogenously, it's going to activate ACAT, which should make sense. If, it, if this cell has too much, then it's going to activate ACAT in order to store it. It's going to inhibit HMG-CoA reductase. Why does it make sense that too much cholesterol is going to inhibit HMG-CoA HMG -CoA reductase? You don't need to make any more, so this is going to inhibit. Now, the part that usually kind of, or that sometimes trips people up, myself included, is that it actually also inhibits the LDL receptors. So on a genetic level, you're going to, this cell is going to stop making LDL receptors because it's going to say its cholesterol needs have been met, so therefore we don't need to take in any more. So it's going to inhibit these. So if you keep on getting way too much cholesterol, you're going to stop producing the LDL receptors. So therefore, that cholesterol's got to go somewhere. Okay, that's where bad things happen, and you can get cholesterol just in really weird places in your body, not just in your 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 um, you know blood uh, your what am I looking for uh, bloodstream. Okay. <clears throat> And so that's why make sure you can understand everything that's going on right here in this diagram. Yeah? You said the pH gradient changes throughout this cell. Is that just like whenever it's finding 
formed into a vesicle that their pH is different than the cytosol or like the further you go? It does, and I'm not a cell biologist, so I don't know what triggers the change in the pH itself. But that's why the, the, the lysosome itself has a very, very acidic. Mm -hmm. And the Golgi apparatus across the trans Golgi network, it changes as it goes through. I don't have those. Okay. I have no replay. It's, it's, so it's kind of it's For me, and I was different than that it's just, I'm like, it just does, but. Just like when it's traveling through the different organelles, not just in the cytosol. Mm -hmm. like I didn't know if you were saying like within the cytosol, the pH changes. No, I don't know if it has to interact with something along the way in order for it to, to change, or if it's something that's just in, endogenous to the lipid membrane itself, like your rapset or something that it helps trigger the change as it goes through. All right, this is essentially the same thing. It's not as pretty. Or it's not as cartoony, I should say. But it's, it's taking through the entire thing. Except it also then does add in the hormones as well. And I would expect at this point in time for you to be able to understand why insulin would activate versus glucagon would inhibit. Okay, this. And so why would you, I'm gonna actually start with glucagon. Why do you suppose that glucagon is going to inhibit HMG CoA reductase? What is glucagon? Right, you get glucagon indicates what's happening in your bloodstream. Low blood sugar. So you're not gonna want to be making cholesterol for storage if you have low blood sugar. You're gonna to want to free up all that other stuff to be able to go through gluconeogenesis and make glucose. Okay. And insulin's this exact opposite. That's why usually if you can think of one versus the other, it makes sense. Insulin, you've just eaten, you've got lots, so you can now store things. Um, yeah, that's okay. <clears throat> All right. And so we only have a couple of other slides on here. And so I'll pick up these on the next class. And if I can remember, I'll also show you that video because it is an. <laughs> so this is just a little another cartoon showing pretty much the exact same thing that we've been going over. It's just a different demonstration for it, for the fates, fates, possible fates of cholesterol. I can say that right. Um, within the cell. And so there are some pluses and minuses to this one. It is oversimplification, but you can see where, you know, that other figure that I showed, there's more than one for the receptors because you have to have that clap and coated pit for the invagination. Eventually it will change with respect to the pH balance. You recycle the receptors and then you're going to do the, in, um, you're either going to store it or you're going to. Um, uh, use it, okay, so for one of the things. And so remember, it's ACAT, which is the enzyme name, the enzyme name here, is the one that turns it into cholesterol esters. <coughs> and this whole process right here is regulated if the, it's downregulated, I should say, I should specify, if you have an uh, influx, if you have too much cholesterol being stored. Okay, so it's going to stop making and regurgitating, recycling, that's probably the word for it, the LDL receptors, so. And then this is just up here. You do not need to memorize these. Please do not memorize these. But it's just to show you that there is more than one type. Okay, there are lots of these lipoproteins, lots of these um, types of complexes that you see. It's not this LDL, but and they can have a whole host of different functions. Okay, so uh, it's just to show you that it's not so simple. And um, I would have to give you a table like this and say, you know, to give you some type of logic, like what would happen if you're you know, if you decrease, for example, APO, was it APOC2, then if you decrease it, you're going to have a decrease in the lipase, and so, you know, what kind of effect would that have? Well, then, obviously, if you decrease in lipase, then you're not going to be breaking down the lipids, and so that kind of stuff. Are there any questions? Because this is the end of, in my computer, I don't know who this decided to stop. Any questions? Awesome.